glad for the privilege to be part of this end time work. This is not what I'm going to preach about tonight, but I've been encouraged by the story of Gideon. And I really like how he narrowed down his troops. And I was thinking about what Brother Ray said last night, that maybe it's time for a good house cleaning. And I think that's kind of what Gideon was doing as he dealt with his men there at the bank. And the Bible says that he told anyone that was afraid to just go ahead and go home. And I would like to extend that invitation to you this evening that if you're afraid that this is going to cost you too much, that it's going to take too much of your time, that you might lose your family, that you might lose yourself, then you can go ahead and go home. If it's going to crimp your lifestyle and make you miserable, go ahead and go home. The Bible says about 10,000 men went home after that. A large portion. But God wasn't done with the cleaning yet. He brought them down to the bank of the river to see how they were going to drink. And by the time God was done, he went from 20,000 to 300 men. And this evening, I would like to say that if God would need to minimize us to 300 people that were sold out for this cause, no matter what it took, behind Gideon's vision and Gideon's burden, we could accomplish more with that than 20,000 cowards who were unwilling to do what it took to get behind Gideon. And I'm encouraged with that this evening. I know it looks like they've got a lot of people on us, but with God, 300 is the majority. And I believe this evening we have more than 300 in this room that are willing to pay the price. Now, I wanted to start my message this evening. First of all, greet the apostles. Most of all, Brother Ray, Brother Randy, and Brother Steve. I also want to greet the apostles' children. Brother Amos, I told you I would one time. <laughs> I want to greet the apostles' children. Unless you're an apostle's child, you have no understanding of what these children go through. And I also want to greet the apostles' wives and, and thank them for what they're doing for the work of restoration. Amen. And finally, I want to greet my family, my children, and Brother Alfred, who's not here, and trust that God is going to bless them richly for the sacrifice they're making for the gospel. And now I'd like to turn to Romans chapter 12. I ask you to pray for the word of God. Amen. Romans chapter 12, in verse 1. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. We see here in the scriptures that we are commanded as the children of God to not be conformed to the world. But instead of being conformed, we are to be transformed by the renewing of our minds. We are pressured on all sides around us to conform to the agenda that the kings of the earth have put out. Conform means 
to conform oneself to another pattern, to fashion alike, that is to conform to the same pattern and to fashion according to. This evening, brother and sister, you are being pressured to become like the world. There is a force that is put on you, saint of God, even in this room, to be like the world. The billboards that are on the side of the road, the clothes that are being sold in the department stores, the music that is being played around us is all an attempt to get you to conform to the world. Conform means to act in accordance with expectations, to behave in the manners of others, especially as a result of social pressure. And if you're a human being this evening, you have felt the pressures of the world to get you to be like them. But the scripture here instructs us not to be conformed to the world, not to be like those that are out in the world, but rather to be transformed. How can we be transformed? A transformation is different than being conformed. Because to be conformed means to become alike, but to be transformed means to actually be moved across to another place, to another side, over and beyond. It means to change the nature, condition, or function of. So in a world where we are being pressured on all sides to conform, how are we able to transform? And I believe the answer is in verse 1. That ye present your bodies a living sacrifice. What I like about this verse goes right along with what Brother Ernest preached last night, that you present yourself a living sacrifice. God is not chasing the goats around to try to get them onto the altar. But it is your job to present yourself a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God. And in that living sacrifice, it's not a one-time deal. It's not a momentary thing that happens and then you're done. But you remain living because it means the sacrifice continues on until the Lord's return. Reasonable service. You need to be able to change forms. As we consider being transformed or conformed, the word that is in both of those is formed. And brother and sister, tonight you are being formed by something. You are either being formed by the pressure of the world or you, being, or you are being formed by God's holy apostles. I was thinking about this today, that there is a form that you must fit into. You've got two options. The form of the world or the form of the doctrine of the apostles. And I'm sure that if you are a construction worker or if you've made a cake, the form is already there. All that is left to do is pour yourself into it, presenting yourself a living sacrifice. It is not for you to decide which direction you're going to go, but rather which form you're going to choose. And it is only a reasonable response to what God has done on Calvary for you to present yourself to a transformation from the worldly mind frame 
to a glorious work of God. In order to be transformed, you're going to have to be in submission. But the thing about it is, is that no matter who you are, you are in submission to something. Because you're being in a form. You're in a form. Now, it doesn't take any guts to be conformed to the world. Young people, it doesn't take anything to wear skinny jeans and to have a stupid hairdo and to listen to stupid music. That is nothing. That is what everyone else in the world is doing. You aren't special because you're doing what the world is doing. There's no pride in that at all. But where the pride is, is in the transformation. And I feel like as the saints, individually and as a church collectively, we find ourselves in a critical time. A time where we are choosing which form we're going to take. And in this critical time, young people, there is no desire whatsoever for us to blend in with the world. We are not seeking in any way to lose our distinction of who we are. We desire and will maintain a distinction between us and the world. There is no desire for us to change our dress. There is no desire for us to have worldly music. I'm not saying other music, I'm saying worldly music. There is no desire for us to change our standards. We still believe in the one church message more than ever before. We are only one locality, separated only by location. Then we are not congregationalists. We will never be congregationalists. What Brother Steve can do in Muncie, Brother Steve can do in Elmer, Brother Steve can do in Warsaw, and Brother Steve can do in Cecil. The seats that these brethren and apostles sit on are the same in every location. We are not seeking to dumb down the salvation message. We still believe and recognize and require a crisis experience of salvation. We are not seeking to lower our standard to conform to the world. Matter of fact, our message continues to be and always will be. We must have a transformation. We must be taken up above and across the things that have been set up. There comes a power in transformation that does not come in conforming. A power that comes no other way. And let me tell you tonight, the power that comes in transformation is extremely attractive. In all of your endeavors to win the world, remember this, the thing the world wants is the thing that you have. If the world wanted more of the world, it would go to the world. But I believe with all of my heart, there are people out there that want what you have. And the world doesn't need more people like them who are confused, who are conformed, who are socially pressured, who are moved by what social media tells them to do and wearing clothes like what the billboard says and listening to the music that the kings of the earth have set up. They need something more. 
there's plenty of them, and their solution isn't working. I believe tonight that while the world is going to be won, it's not by more social programs. I don't believe they're going to be won by volleyball games and pizza parties. We've always believed it, and I believe that tonight. But they're going to be won by the foolishness of preaching. They're going to be won not by diplomacy. Understand what I'm saying? They're not going to be won by stooping down to their level, but they're going to be won when good old-fashioned Holy Ghost-filled men and women preach the Word of God. And understand what I'm saying here? I want us to increase in our singing, and I, you know who I am. I want us to increase in our strategy. But when it's all done and said, what's going to work, what's going to win is the preaching of the Word of God. What we need, what the world needs, is not dumbed-down religion, not someone else who teaches them how to conform, but what the world needs is old-fashioned salvation. I believe old-fashioned salvation still works for every culture, for every country, for every people. I believe it transcends language. I believe it transcends cultural barriers and stereotypes and works down into the depths of the soul. And I believe the gospel is attractive. I don't believe we've got to dress it up one little bit. I believe we preach it how it is and souls will be saved. I don't believe this evening that the answer is more protest. I'm not saying we wouldn't go to a protest, but the only reason we'd go to a protest is so they might be able to get them in here to hear a message. I don't believe the answer is more protest. I don't believe the answer is more gatherings. I believe the answer is the solid truth and the word of God. They've had gatherings. They've had all kinds of social clubs. They've had all kinds of religious things going on. And it's not worked. Because it's only, a con it's only conforming to what's already there. I believe that as we preach the gospel, we will take care of long-term problems. But protests and volleyball games are short-term and when it's over, you're left with the same carnal, sinful heart. But with the preaching and the word of God coming forward, there can be a regeneration and a transformation of those souls. Now, Paul says, I am not ashamed. you to understand this. I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. What gospel is he talking about? Is he saying he's not ashamed of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John? I'm talking about the written word. Not only He's saying, I'm not ashamed of the men, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. I'm not ashamed of what they preach. I'm not ashamed of what they do. What is the gospel to you tonight? Is it some mystical way of their gospel that is never touches you, never holds you accountable? Paul said he was not ashamed of the gospel. I'll tell you tonight what the gospel is. The gospel tonight is Brother Ray D. T Brother D. Ray Tinsman. The gospel tonight is Brother Stephen Hargrave and Brother Randy Hargrave and these other holy brethren and apostles. Are you ashamed of these brethren? Because if you are, you are ashamed of the gospel. Are you, un are you unwilling to profess me in public and say that is my apostle? If you are, you are ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. 
And being ashamed doesn't just mean you say I'm ashamed, because none of you in this room would do that, probably. But you're ashamed when you budge on the standards. You're ashamed when you live on the edge of the world. You're ashamed when you hope people don't find out you're part of the church of God. You're ashamed when you're listening to worldly music that Brother Steve has not approved. Ashamed. You're ashamed when you sisters don't look like me, but you got to have your own style and your own thing and your own way. You're ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. You're ashamed whenever you're more worried, whenever you think that the sports figures are greater and better than these apostle brethren. When you follow the stats of that more than going to meetings to see if you might be able to spend time with Brother Steve and Brother Randy. You're ashamed whenever you sisters look in fashion magazines and think that those women are more beautiful and better dressed than I am. I'm not ashamed of the gospel, Paul said. You're ashamed. You're ashamed whenever your music is cooler than my music. You're ashamed whenever you can't have a radical Holy Ghost testimony of how you were delivered from sin and have a real experience in your soul. Let me tell you something. You know what? The world wants apostles. Do you know why Trump had a following? Trump is a wicked man. But he was a leader. And the world is looking for apostles. Are you ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ? Too many of you are being pressured to be conformed to the world. You're a little bit ashamed of us when you go to the grocery store. You're a little bit ashamed of us on the job. You're a little bit ashamed of us with that new contact, hoping they don't find out all about the church of God right now. I'm ashamed. And some of you need to be picked up and transformed. Now, I want to say something to the saints besides the apostles. You don't need to teach us anything. I want to tell you all something. You aren't going to lead the way in standard changing. introducing the new music. You young people should not have Spotify and iTunes and Apple Music and all of that other garbage. And I want to say this too, with Brother Steve's permission. I got to wait, Brother Steve's got to listen because I got to make sure I'm okay. Brother Steve, I want to say this too. They're not going to interpret your message for the church. Amen. When Brother Steve gets done preaching, it's none of your business to go around and talk about and interpret. And what do you think he said? And what do you think he meant? That is none of your business. You are not, you are not, you are not the form. You will never be the form. It doesn't matter how much money you give. It doesn't matter how much money you have. It doesn't matter how many friends you got. You will never.
platform. We still believe in plain weddings. We still believe in plain receptions. We still believe in plain clothing. We still believe in plain houses and vehicles and hairstyles. We still believe in dressing up for service and coming pressed in our soul. And we still believe in raising little saints that look just like us. to budge on anything. And I'm going to throw this in here. We apostles might be able to do something you'll never be able to do. You know why? Because you're the children. Some of you need to tighten up in your dress. Some of you need to tighten up in the watches you're wearing. Some of you need to tighten up in the hairstyles you have. Some of you need to tighten up in the clothes that you have on. Some of you need to sell out your fancy cars and get some old clunkers. And some of you need to downsize your homes. Some of you need to get rid of your Spotify. Not all of you, but some of you. And all of you need to receive your music through the apostles and not from yourself. We ought to be the most proud people on the face of the earth. We still believe that it would be good for some of you young men to get dressed up on your suit on a Tuesday morning and walk through Walmart. We still believe that it would be all right for some of you sisters to go through Walmart testifying to the souls you met on the road about what God has done for you. I told the young people recently it would be appropriate on a summer day for them to roll down the windows of their car and to blare out one of Brother Jay's special songs at the stop sign so the whole world could hear what we got going. They want to be so cool. But let me tell you, young people, something. You ain't ever going to be cool. You're never going to be cool. We're cool. And if you want to be something spectacular, if you want to be something attractive, if you want to be something beautiful, if you want to be something handsome, be like us. I believe that pride what we believe produces desire in others to join. I have never seen a military man that was ashamed of his uniform. Are you ashamed of yours? Now I want to tell you something. We do dress like this for modesty, but there's other ways we could dress to be modest. We dress like this for distinction. You know why we dress like this? To brand you. We want all the young ladies at Walmart to know when you win, young men walk through. Oh, I better leave those young men alone. The church of God. Some of you have been a little ashamed. But I got something to tell you. You want to win the world? You want to see the multitudes come in? You want to see the Lord come back? I believe as soon as you believe, the world will believe. 
believe. As soon as you believe, not a mystical belief, but as soon as you believe in the apostles and the doctrine of the apostles and the standards of the apostles and more than believe but are proud, the world will believe. Do you know that you've got a calling on your life? Even if you're not a preacher, even if you're not a singer, here's your calling. You're supposed to tempt the world. You're supposed to make the world want what you have. Salvation is attractive. Oh, and I found that to be so. I've seen good, good, um, I've seen people look better as saints. And as soon as they leave the assembly of the saints, they get ugly. Let me tell you something. You are not an exception to that rule. The only reason you're beautiful tonight is if you're adorned with salvation. And when you drop that garment, you become an ugly duckling without a possibility of becoming a swan. I didn't really mean to say that, it just came out. <laughs> I believe that what the world needs today is strong young men and young women that can show them what it means to really be saved. Now, some of you are lacking in this room tonight because you're not presenting. You're not presenting your body a living sacrifice. You're living to yourself. You're living to your desires. You're doing your own things. And you're stuck. You're stuck. You can never understand what's going on with the apostles. You can never understand the doctrines that are being taught. You don't understand the standards. You don't understand what we teach. You know why? Because you've been conformed and you need a transformation. You're in a rut. You've been there for years. You've gone round in circles in your mind over and over and over. Are there apostles? Should we say there's apostles? We've been preaching this for years. You've seen God move and you're still in a rut. You know why? Because you're too worried about the social pressure of the world. Your family's stuck. And you know what? You're going to stay there unless someone comes along. Some of you need picked up from the pit you dug for yourself and translated over and over and over again. And this evening, one of my favorite songs that I haven't heard live for a while, but maybe I'll hear live again soon, is called, That's What Angels Are For. You know the scripture that says that he will pick you up. Angels will pick you up lest you dash your foot against a stone. The call today is not to be conformed. The call today isn't even to change yourself. But the call today is to allow yourself to be picked up and to be translated. You've got to let the angels get their hands on you. Some of you are afraid of the angels because maybe you've been hurt in the past. Maybe people haven't been good to you. Maybe your father wasn't good to you. Maybe your mother wasn't good to you. Maybe you were in Babylon and there was a bad minister. 
ministry there. But brother and sister, you have not come to that place tonight and your excuses are no. If you expect to escape this world, if you expect to escape the form the world is constantly chasing after to throw on you, to throw on your mind, to mess with your soul, you must allow the angels to grab a hold of everything about you and pick you up. Some of you haven't been changing from glory to glory. And you're waiting for some great big miracle. You're looking for some great big thing to do. And you know what it is? It's the little thing that's right in your hands. Some of you have been praying over the same battles and the same struggles. You're trying to understand the same things over and over again. And you're waiting for some great big thing. And all it is is a little thing that's right in your hand. You've got all the knowledge, all the understanding, all the tools. Some of you would do better spiritually if you changed your hairdo. If you got different clothes that were looser. If you listened to different music. Little things that you can do today that could change you for eternity. This evening the Bible says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present yourself, present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. May the Lord bless you tonight.